Um, there's one uh, sonic aspect of sampling that I didn't stop and explain as well as I wanted to explain last time, so I want to go back and and just do it do it harder. Uh, and that is the the business about if you have a looping sampler, there are two regimes in which you can hear the thing. One is where you have the sampler playing back um, either looped or not loopedly slowly enough that you hear individual starts and stops as, as events. And that would mean perhaps playing fewer than 30 different things a second. So uh, here the example would be, whoops, that's not a good example. Right. So now you just hear one of the, one of the dude's phonemes six times a second, right? Um, this, by the way, is a, is a copy annotated and then partly de-annotated of, the, of the, one of the patches that I made last class. So this is up on the web. Um, and my, my purpose in making the patch was to show you how to, how to add the envelope generator shaping to uh, the phaser. But now what I want to do is continually, continue to look at the phaser-driven sampler because it's the more appropriate way to look at this to compare again what happens at low and high frequencies of, of phaser. Um, what happens at low frequencies is kind of exactly what you would expect, which is you hear um, you hear stuff at a certain number of times per second. And furthermore, OK, so what's happening here is this 34 is the beginning place. Oh, it's in hundreds of samples, which means 441 of these make a second. So this is the beginning place in, sorry, in the, in the, not in that table, in this table. Whoa, how did that work? I guess I have another patch open and it's reading out of that table, sorry. I'm going to get us all confused if I don't close this. Or I'm going to get me all confused anyway. Okay, now how do I get rid of that? I do something with it, okay. Ah, come on, all right. Back to normal. All right, so, um, so what's happening is we're looking in this array, and we're looking starting at whatever 34 impl uh, or corresponds to here. And then we are sliding forward 78 of them. Is that me shaking? How is that happening? Is that an earthquake? I think they were having a nice little earthquake. We just invented a new kind of seismograph. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's something totally anodyne. OK. Um, so 34, seven, so this 78 is now being multiplied by the phaser. So the phaser is going from 0 to 1. And now we're making the phaser have a range, which in hundreds anyway, starts at 34 and goes to 34 plus 78. So this is the amount of sample you hear each time. So that, um, you, once you've got the units right anyway, if this thing times this thing equals 1, you've got the straight ahead transposition. That's to say the original pitch. And what would that be? Actually, let me change the units so that it's easier to think about. I'm going to make these be units of 441 so that these are hundredths of a second. And now this will be something like 9, and this will be something like 20. Yeah, there we go. All right. So now what's happening is this is uh, 0.17 seconds because 441 samples is 0 0.01 seconds at our sample rate. And this 0.17, that times 6, if you multiply it out in your head, turns out to be very close to 1. Actually, 1 sixth is, as you all know, uh, 0.1666, so we'll do this. And now we'll get the original transposition. <laughs> This number in hundredths, that's to say 0.1666 repeating times 6 is 1. And now if I choose some other pair of numbers which also multiplies out to 1, such as make that 5 and make that 20 hundredths, then I've changed the, hit, I've changed the speed at which the thing is happening, but I haven't changed the pitch that you hear of, or the transposition that you hear of the sample. Is it clear why this is working? So, so the transposition that you hear is proportional both to this number and also to this number. All right. Okay, next thing about that is this. Um, this is something that you 
um, well, this is, this is what you hear when you hear, when these numbers are below about 30. That's to say a number of things that you can hear as happening as discrete events. So even if I push this to 20 and drop this to 5, oops, and find a good place, you hear the events as a repeating thing. But if I push this past about 30, you won't anymore. Mm, 30, I don't know, it's iffy. But of course, this is a very particular spiky part of the sample. If I go somewhere else in the sample, then it becomes very hard to hear that as a sequence of things and easy to hear it just as a continuum. And if I push this higher, then at some point, your perception of this as having a pitch becomes more important than your perception of it as, as being uh, a number of times per second. And this is just acoustics. If you do anything fast enough, it becomes uh, repeatedly, repeatedly fast enough it becomes a pitch, right? Okay, now, oh yeah, so for instance, if I want to be able to do, to use this uh, uh, Western style musically, we would want a MIDI to frequency converter. And then, let's see, make another number box. And then I can say, well, play that for me and play it at middle C, please, 60, which is 261 hertz. And now we've got middle C. I could check it on the piano if I cared, but... Oh yeah, let's go down an octave, because that's a little too harsh. And now... Ooh. Why does that sound so ugly? <coughs> There's something going on here that I don't understand, because that should be a smoother sound than that, but we'll go with it for now, and if I ever find my mistake, I'll tell you. So at this point, now we're playing five milliseconds of sample at a time, uh, but we're playing them, ooh, we're, we're transposing up quite a bit uh, because we're playing 130 of these per second. So really this should last something under one millisecond. It should last about 0.7 milliseconds, I think. Oh, and this will sound better now, maybe. Yeah, there we go. All right, and now we have the sample as before. Those are timbres taken from the voice. In fact, I could even try to move this continuously, except I'm gonna get in trouble, you'll see. It's a little ugly because you hear a click every time this thing changes discontinuously. So let's go find soft. Right. And now, so that, if you like, is, I mean, I've proved, I, when, when you heard it coursing over the, the sample, then you heard the, the tampers or the vowels and consonants of the original sample going by. So right now, you could sort of believe that this thing is the O, of, the short O of soft. That's, of course, assuming I'm playing everything at the correct speed. In other words, I've made the, this and this multiply to approximately one. I didn't check that it was exactly it. Oh, I could. I could, nah, it's not. I could, I could take this and divide a thousand by it and put that there. But actually, that would be a good thing to do because I'm going to have to do it later. So to do that, we're going to divide something, but we're not going to divide it by a thousand. We want to divide a thousand by it. And that's the thing I haven't shown you how to do yet. But it's not hard. The thing, so what you want to do is you want to take a thousand. Sorry, a hundred. We're going to take a hundred divided by this, right? Because it's in hundreds of samples. So we're going to take this and put it here, but then we're going to have to bang the 100. And so we need our old friend trigger to make the thing get banged at the appropriate time. So now we say trigger, bang, float. Sorry, let's make this be reasonable. Okay, and now I'll show you the, oh, I'll, rather than show it to you, I'm just gonna use it and we'll see. So now I'll say 48 again, please. And ta-da, I computed the exact value, which was 100 divided by this, which is the number of hundredths of a second, which would, which would be the period if this is the frequency. 
this would be a good place to stop for questions. Oh, okay. This is uh, okay. So this is an abbreviation for trigger bang float. And what trigger does is two things. It it formats messages for you. So there's a floating point message coming in, and what we want coming out is a bang here to to send this 100, and then a uh, and actually before that a floating point number, which is whatever we sent in. So this divide needs to receive 100 here, and then it needs to receive this 130.8 here. But the divide divides when it receives this number. And so it needs to receive this number after it has already gotten that one so that it will do the division correctly. Sorry, there are two questions. You, you first? What's the first? Well, uh, the bang is simply to get this 100 to send out, because if this 100 doesn't get sent out, this thing will never divide. It sends the float, and then it sends a bang, which sends this 100. Uh, let's see, this is going to be 100 over this floating point number. Okay, let me, uh, let me see if I can make this into an ex a more synthetic example. Okay, let's make a copy of this. All right, so a number comes in, number comes out, and whatever I put in, what comes out should be 100 divided by this number. Okay, so how do I do that? The number goes in, and I ask it first to put the number in. Okay, this is the divider, so what I need to do with the divider is first put 5 in here, and then put 100 in there, so the thing will do 100 divided by 5. Right. Yeah, lots of questions. Let's see, I don't even know who to ask. Okay. Oh, trigger is defined um, to put its outputs out in, in right to left order. It's and in general objects that have multiple outlets that that uh, spit out messages at the same time, another example would be unpack. Always do it from right to left order so that um, so that you know what order they're coming into a subsequent box in. Okay, this order doesn't mean that time is passing. All this happens in one instant of time, or, or to put it a different way, between two audio samples, but the same two. In other words, it happens in in a moment that doesn't that isn't allocated any time of its own, and yet it has an order because you have to have this thing go in the in the correct order. Otherwise, you could never program. Okay, this PD is not a programming language, and this is asking PD to do a programming language-ish thing, which it can do. But obviously, if you just had Basic or C or something like that, you could do this particular thing a lot easier. You would just say a hundred divided by it. F or whatever it is. But since we're in a graphical programming language, it's great for doing things like bashing signals around like that, and it's a little clunky for doing things like saying 100 over F. This is the easiest way I know how to do that. There are others. Other questions about that? Yeah. Um, so for when you're changing the, the range for the quantity, so if you wanted not to do this one, you want that to do this. Uh, yeah. This value, okay. You just have to connect that to the path or the line, or you want it not to click. You want it not to click. In other, oh, you mean if I wanted these things to be their values when the patch shows up? If yeah, like the, the cycle to do that. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, so right now I haven't done anything to automate that. I've just left it as a as a number box, but. In fact, that could be messages coming in from some other place if I wanted to. And then I could use the number box to allow you to override it, or I could just have it be what it is. But it's easiest, I mean, just for, just for the purposes of showing the patch, it's easiest to have everything just be controlled by hand. <coughs> yeah? Now, if you put the word floats in there, and you put, like, a metro in there, do you create, like, a loop that sequences things? Uh, sure. Well, okay, sure. There would be some work to do because 
if, for instance, okay, so if, for instance, I had a, a bunch of numbers in a message like like that, if if I sent those to this, for instance, this number would become one, and then it would become three, and then it would become five, and then it would become seven, and seven would win. If I wanted to do those things and have it be one, then three at a later moment in time, and then five, and then seven, which would be more like a sequence, then the easiest way to do that would be to store those numbers in a table or an array, and then read them out of the array using a metronome. Yeah? Yeah. Ooh. Okay, yeah. Outlets are right to left. Things inside a message box are left to right, or in the order that they are as text. Yeah, that's confusing, isn't it? It never occurred to me to think about those two things in the same thought. <laughs> yeah? Can you depend on everything uh, other than if you're having Well, what you can't do, or what you can't depend on, is this. Let's see, I'm going to erase this now. Uh, I'm, I'm going to—I might have shown you this already. I can't remember. I'm going to take this number and just square it by multiplying it by itself, and I'll do it that way. This doesn't work because. This, uh, th this multiplier got these two values all right, but it got this value first and that value afterward, and as a result, it did the wrong multiply. So to, to make that guaranteed, you would put a trigger in to make sure that the thing happened at the order that you wanted it. In other words, you would say, oh, I'll keep the wrong one and the right one. You would say, ugh, all right, go away. Why am I looking at that screen? I should look at my screen. Sorry. Okay, trigger bang, or sorry, trigger float float. And now we know that this float will come first and this float will come second. And then it'll do my squaring job right. Whereas here it didn't. So, so in general, you can't. Um, yes, if if the outlets are all, that's the right word. Well, an, an example of something that doesn't do that is route, because it doesn't ever put something out more than one outlet as a result of a single message. But things that do put out more than one thing as a result of a single message, such as uh, trigger or unpack or note in, if you're doing MIDI or I don't have a lot of other examples here. Uh, those all, those all are, are arranged from right to left. And that's simply because right to left is, is appropriate for inlets. Because it's best to get things left last. Yeah? Yeah. It gets ugly. Yeah, so if you wanted to do, hmm, what's a good example of that? Hmm, yeah. I have a good example, but it's too complicated. I'd, I'd have to explain it. But if you want to do A plus B times C, for instance, well, okay, so you put B and C into a multiplier, and then you have A, and then you want to put it into an adder. Then you have to decide, well, okay, do I want that number to change every time I change any of a, B, and C, or do I want it to change only when C changes, or so on, like that? You could want it either way. For instance, if, if you're playing a, a MIDI keyboard and, and you want to transpose, when you change the transposition, you don't want it to replay the note. You, that just means that you want the next note you play to have the new transposition. So in that case, it would be appropriate not to recalculate the pitches of all the notes because you change the transposition, maybe. But in, in other situations, you want actually to have the output change regardless of w when any of the inputs changes so that it's always correct according to the last inputs. And those are just two different situations. So you can, you can get PD to do one or the other. The way to get it to, to do 
the way to get it always to follow what you do is to use triggers everywhere that you need to in order to make sure that everybody's leftmost and what gets whacked last, and then, it'll, and then everything will stay up to date. That was a little abstract, but it, we'll, we'll hit examples of that, I think, later on in the quarter. Especially if I go back and show you pitch to MIDI conversion in general. So, other questions? That was useful because I think I think there were a bunch of things I wasn't saying that I should have been saying that, that helped clear up. <laughs> okay, so maybe I can just leave this there. Oh, I don't want to leave this here though because this is cluttering my screen. Okay, so now what we have is I've got this number here and I'm computing 100 divided by it to put here so that now I can do this kind of thing. It's, it's not perfectly smooth, but it's now figuring out what I have to put here in order to get the timbre, well, in order to get the sample to play back at the, at the recorded speed, regardless of how many times per second I'm asking it to play back. So the faster I ask it to play back, the less of it I can play back each time if I'm, if I'm trying to constrain the speed of the concert. Okay. Now, the other thing to, to, to mention about this is that, okay, now I've got a nice pitch, and now we could just go and change this segment size without changing the number of times per second. And then we get this kind of thing. Notice there are clicks in the sound. That's because when I change this discontinuously, or when I change this according to the mouse, it changes the, uh, it changes the thing I'm multiplying the phaser by. And so it causes the read into the table here to move discontinuously, which is a click. So if I want to do this correctly, I'd have to use a line object to de-click this. Nonetheless, I now have my first nice timbre whammy bar that you could use to make wonderful computer music, right? In other words, this is, I think, the first example, except for that attempt that I made to explain FM, which I shouldn't have ever done. This is the first example of a situation where you can change a control, and it will actually make an audible change of the timbre of the sound, which is, of course, what computer music was supposed to have been about back in the day. There will be many more examples of this, because eventually you'll be able to make filters and, and frequency modulation once I get that straightened out and other things like that. Um, Right now, the, the reason this is happening, I can actually show you using this table. Uh, let me, oh, so, so just for emphasis sake, um, if we go down to a frequency where you can actually hear the things, then what I'm doing is I'm changing the size of the sample we're playing, which is changing the transposition, right? But then if you make that happen at an audible rate, then we're changing the transposition again, but it doesn't change the, the pitch that you hear because the pitch that you hear is now no longer the pitch of the original sample, but is the new pitch which is being imposed on it by the fact that I'm reading it at a, at a fast rate. Uh, and that is, in fact, a continuum. So, for instance, you can say, moving back and forth between pitchy sounds and sampled sounds. And that, a lot of people heard for the first time when Fat Boy Slim did that song, Rock Rockefeller Skank. That was this. Okay. Questions about that? Yeah. No. <laughs> He wasn't using Super Collider either, though. <laughs> he was using commercial stuff. All right. Okay, so, so now this, which becomes a transposition when we do it slow, is a timbre change when we do it fast. Whoa, that's too much. And another way of seeing that is to take this thing and graph it now what I propose to do by using these graphs over here. So I'm going to keep the phaser, and instead of graphing the envelope, which is what this graph was here to do earlier, 
I just want to graph the output of the tab read object. Ooh, yuck. Oh, I see. I've got the I've got this thing so high that the graphing doesn't look good. So let's change the properties here. I had 44 that's a tenth of a second. I'm going to need like a fiftieth of a second. So let's make this a thousand. That's actually a forty-four point one of a second. And let's see, does this work? Still looks, oh, whoops. I didn't do that quite right. I need to change this to, oh, and this. <laughs> Sorry, I got two tables in there. Sorry, two arrays inside there, which is why I got confused. Okay, so now what we see is there's a nice phaser, and it's going at 48 times a second. And each time it goes, you see the same waveform, which is, in fact, the waveform which is stolen from the original recording. And now if I ask it to read, so, so if I ask it to graph again, you'll see that it's in a different place because I don't know how to make the graph start right when the thing wraps around. That's for later. But you can see that it's the same waveform. Now if I say, okay, do that, but make this number larger, in other words, make there be more of the sample. Let's, actually, let's have there be less of the sample first. I'll drop it to one. Then when I graph it, you'll see that the, there just got, there was just less waveform stuffed into there. Is this clear? Okay, now you can do wonderful things because what would happen if you just stuck a sinusoid in here? Actually, that would be a useful thing to be able to do, so let's do it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say tab right for, no, tab right, there's no four. And I give it the name of the thing, table 203A. And now I'm just going to take a nice sinusoid. I don't know, maybe 110 hertz, so it won't be too different from the, from the sound of the dude's voice. And I don't want it to be quite that loud because I don't have a good volume control, so I'm going to protect us by multiplying this by some small number, smallish number. Okay, and now we need a button to make this thing happen. Bing, wait two seconds, and sinusoid, although you can't really see it as such. And now, here, sinusoid! <laughs> Except, of course, the sinusoid has a discontinuity every time we restart the sample. And now, the, more, the bigger a, a chunk I read here of the sample, the more cycles of the sinusoid it has to slap into the, into the same amount of time. And if you can imagine what this would sound like, it's, well, it's got this period, so the, so the pitch of it isn't changing, but you can tell by looking at it that it's got a lot of stuff at this frequency and maybe not a whole lot of stuff at the fundamentals, say. So now if we listen to it, we've made ourselves a nice little formant. Yeah, the pops are, okay, the pops happen whenever I change this, and what that does is that changes the amount I'm multiplying this phaser by. If I happened to do that right when the phaser was at zero, it wouldn't make a discontinuous change. Right. But as it is, you know, it gets up to a half or something like that, and then suddenly it rearranges and that pushes it off to a different value. And yeah, I'll show you things about that later. Um, yeah after I've stuffed all these more fundamental ideas into your heads. <laughs> the object you want is uh, sample and hold, because you want, to, you want to sample this thing only when, you want to sample this number only when the phaser uh, changes values, or changes cycles. Okay, but, but of course, the, the thing that I had originally was not a sinusoid, it was the man's voice, 
and then you get this look and this sound. And of course, different parts in the sound file give you different different things, but they all have the same sort of oh, you know, basic behavior. All right, so that is basically a thing about sampling that everyone can use. Questions about this before I go on to, to other things? What I want to do now is go back to polyphony and voice management, which I started talking about last time, but about which there's much more to say. Yeah, everyone's tired of this topic anyway. Yeah? Oh, sure. This one is going to be, yeah, this is patched. I have to change the order of these because I didn't plan very well, but this will be official. All, all the patches up through last time are up on the web, and it takes me a day or two, but I eventually get around to putting good comments on that actually mean something and then putting them up. Yeah, this is, this is a good trick. Okay. So now, I have several matters to go over. First off, uh, here's, the, here, here's the example of a multiple voice sampler. That was the thing that I showed you guys last time. Right? And the basic deal was, that, well, the new objects that you needed were, um, first off, just the notion of having a, a so-called abstraction, that's to say, being able to put a PD patch inside a window. Um, sorry, inside a box, which would, would in fact be a sub-window, right? And route, which is this, or root, which is this object which takes a message in with any number of numbers and looks at the first number and, depending on what it is, puts it out one of the several outputs. And since there are eight arguments here, there are nine outputs because there's one for if it didn't match anything, and that way you can gang several route objects together. Um, Although here I happen to know that this, that this number is always going to be 0 through 7 because I've got this mod 8 here. Okay, and now, this is, a, this is a thing, well it's an example of polyphonic voice allocation, and there are other examples of things that you can do with polyphonic voice allocation, which I will actually show you by taking you through some pre-existing patches and a slight departure from custom. Um, the so this right now is just, is just a copy of what there was last time. Uh, the first thing I want to mention before I go ripping through the pre-existing examples is a, a thing about abstractions I haven't told you about, which is this. Here's another abstraction. Uh, control, get an edit mode. You can do something like, say, well, I have an abstraction which I moved into this directory beforehand called output tilde. This is interesting because it's not just an abstraction that has a patch inside it, but uh, it also has controls which are printed on its, um, on its faceplate, if you like. So this is a technique for being able to make things like the modular synthesizers give you, which are modules with audio inputs and outputs, but which also have controls like <coughs> knobs. So um, I'm just going to tell you now that this thing exists and how you can deal with it. Well, first off, it's just an object like any other, so I could retype this and it would become some other kind of object. But this is a particular kind of abstraction. Oops, sorry, output. Which does this for us. And if you want to see inside it, it is not good enough to click on it because clicking on it means doing that kind of thing. Oh yeah, and by the way, this is an, an output level in decibels, and you would use this if you wanted to control the, if you wanted to have a, a patch whose output level you could control on the fly, which is a good thing to be able to do. Okay, um, the other thing about this is, of course, you might want to be able to see what's inside it, but clicking on it doesn't do that because clicking on it does that kind of stuff. So instead, you uh, option, you see, control click or right click, depending on what kind of mouse you have, and say open. And then you will see the contents of, of the thing as an abstraction. And it's nothing much more than what you've seen already, except there are some 
tricks here that I haven't told you about yet, which I hope to tell you about today. Okay, and then closing it's the same as it always is. You just close it. All right, so this is a uh, this has a name. It's called a graph on parent abstraction, and the reason being that it it shows a certain portion of its uh, GUI objects, its its um, its controls on it on its own surface as an object, and you can learn how to make these and so on. Um, well, okay, you would say properties and. Notice that here it says graph on parent. You have to click that, and then that turns your, your abstraction into one of these things. But then there are things that you might want to set that, are, that I'll have to explain in detail later. Okay. I'm telling you that because I'm going to take you through some patches that are going to use this, and I want you to know about this thing's existence. If you want to use this, you have to, take, you have to get this thing and copy it into your own directory. I'll throw it up on the website. But it is also on all of your computers because it's actually in PD in the um, help patches. And that is, in fact, where we're headed next. I've been studiously avoiding the help patches because I've been building everything from scratch. But by the time we're getting into voice banky stuff, uh, some of the examples maybe are better just looked at and described than they are built up from scratch because it's, you have to do several things at once and get them all working together. So I'm just going to close this and open some other patches that do other things. There's no, I don't want to see anything. So, in PD, if you say help, uh, one of the things you can get is this browser. And the browser has um, far too much stuff in it, but if you go looking for pure data, oh, by the way, if, if you have PD extended, this really has a lot of stuff. Right now, it merely has a bunch of, of useless stuff. Pure data, audio examples. Oh, right, there's a manual. This is a bunch of HTML <coughs> stuff, which is very telegraphic and um, that's the right word. Short. Control examples, uh, uh, I'll later. Audio examples, which is where, which is examples about how to do synthesis and, and processing and analysis of sounds. These examples correspond to the textbook, which I haven't been referring to very religiously, but we're now somewhere in chapter four of the textbook uh, talking about voice allocation. And the A's are all chapter one, the B's chapter two, and something like that. And so all of this stuff, if you want to see more or more description of what they of what it's about and how it works and why, look in the book in chapter four. And the book actually talks about all these patches in some detail. Okay. Um, the the things I wanted to show you were, for instance, additive synthesis. This is yeah. Oh, here's the reason I showed you output is because we're now going to be starting to use output to set volumes of things. And notice these, out, these, value, these values are in decibels, which means 100 is full blast, and 75 is likely to be quiet. So typically, I put these close to 100. To this means nothing to people who weren't um, in, in the computer music scene in the 60s and 70s, and then it means a lot because this is a computer. This is one of the classical computer music designs done by Jean-Claude Risset at Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill back in the day when people were first doing things with computers. And what it is, let's see if I can make it sound better. What it is is, it's called the Risset Bell. And it's just uh, Jean-Claude Risset having found some parameters somewhere that make a nice bell sound that can do that kind of stuff or this kind of stuff. Or, of course, this kind of stuff. Oops. Yeah. Yeah, actually, better yet. But, uh, okay, this this is not rocket science. What it is is um, the the old word or the old term for this was additive synthesis, and it's synthesis technique that you all know because all you do is you add up oscillators, um, and the oscillators in the examples that I've shown you uh, have all been tuned to multiples of a fundamental frequency so that they fuse into a harmonic sound. In this case, it's additive synthesis in the sense that it's a bunch of sinusoidal oscillators adding together, but the oscillators are imitating the modes of vibration of, of a bell. Although, I don't know if this corresponds to a real bell or, or something fanciful. And 
the controls that you get are uh, correspond exactly to the controls that you saw in the sampler example last time, which is you get to control pitch and duration. Uh, differences between this and the previous example, there are going to be a couple of differences when we get into the voices, but there's a, there's a huge conceptual difference, which is that you don't, this isn't a polyphonic instrument. It only plays one note, but there are, there is still a voice, or what do you call it? There's still voices adding up to the, to the one note, and the voices are, instead of making different notes, making different partials which add it up into a single note. So it's polyphony if you, it's polyphony in one way of thinking because it's, it's realized like a polyphonic instrument, but psychologically it's monophonic. So it's showing the, the use of voice, voicing and, and abstractions in a non-voice allocating way. So a key difference between this and the previous example is there's no route object. In the previous example, you, you decided every time you asked to play a note, which of the voices was going to play it. Here, all the voices play every single note. Yeah? Yes, right. So now I have to show you what's in there. Yep. And next thing is, notice that I'm feeding the thing arguments. I'll tell you what the arguments mean in a moment when I show you what's inside it. But you can, when you have an abstraction, which is to say an object, which is a, which is a separate patch being read into a window, usually, not, not quite always, but in most situations, you're going to want to be able to throw out arguments to specialize it to do one, to do one thing or another. For instance, in this case, each of these partials has to know which partial it is so that they don't all just decide to play the first partial together. They each have to play different partials, and so each one of them has to know which partial it is. And to do that, you have to pass each one arguments that disambiguate them, that tell them how they're going to be specialized. All right. uh, other huge difference. Um, yeah, a huge difference and a small related difference to the huge difference. Um, there, there aren't wires going into these things and inlets. So the mechanism for getting messages inside here is not inlets, it's send and receive. Uh, for the simple reason that, and here's the small conceptual difference, uh, frequency and duration and trigger are being sent separately in this design. This was, I, I thought at the time this was actually simplifying the instrument, although I don't know now whether I think it's more simple or more complicated. Um, so in this particular design, you set, you give it any pitch and any uh, duration you want, and then you say, okay, go ahead, and then it does it for you. And you could now take a packed pair of pitch and duration and make it act like the previous one if you used an unpack and a trigger in order to send messages uh, in the right order to duration and frequency and trigger. Right. So what's going to happen inside here is each one of these things is going to have a receive frequency and a receive duration, which will tell it the global frequency and duration of the tone. And then it's going to have another receive for trigger, which will set the thing off. Right. Now, um, just to, to harken back to music 170 for a moment, um, this is imitating how a bell actually vibrates. A, a, uh, one way, maybe the best way of thinking about how a, a, a metallic object would vibrate is you strike it and in striking it you activate the modes of vibration that, that the thing has. Those are functions of the shape and construction of the object itself, not of, of how you whacked it. They don't move. But the modes each have a frequency and a time constant. The frequency is how fast the mode vibrates and the time constant is how fast it's damped. Whether, uh, whether it vibrates forever, which, which it would do if it had no damping at all, or whether it dies out very, very quickly. So what's happening here is we're pretending that there is a metal object that has 11 modes in it, uh, each, of which is, uh, each of which has a set, uh, different frequency and a different damping. But then there are global frequency and damping, or duration, which is damping, controls that, uh, that are multiplied by each one's individual frequency and damping factor. All right. And now to go look si inside partial, which I've been putting off. 
here's how you do a partial. Now this is, this is being done in gory detail in, in the most uh, carefully explained, uh, boring, uh, pedagogical possible way. Uh, let's see. Well, I guess I'm just going to live with it the way it is. Oh, wait. I can do this. Okay, this is good. Okay, so what's happening is mm, I haven't told you this and probably shouldn't tell you this now, but uh, line tilde generates line segments, and if you want a line segment to feel like an exponential, just raise it to the fourth power. And then instead of going down like this in time, it goes down like this in time. And then it's not exactly an exponential, but it's pretty good. What that means exactly is explained in chapter two of the book, so uh, one. So you can look it up if you, if you don't believe me. But the signal processing aspect of this is being done here. All right, so what you see is an oscillator and a line tilde. I'm, making, I'm raising the line tilde to the fourth power so that it will go down as more exponentially than, a, than uh, just a line segment would. And then I'm multiplying it by the oscillator, and then I'm introducing a new object, throw tilde, which I'll not dwell on right now, but throw tilde is a way of, uh, I didn't even tell you about sin tilde. So this is a way of avoiding having an outlet by asking uh, P to set up a summing bus. In other words, it's, uh, what's happening is somewhere there's a catch tilde sum, which is going to get automatically get the sum of all of these signals. It's a good thing, but it's not a thing that you absolutely have to need, have to know right now. So I'm going to not dwell on it, but just sort of say that that's what's happening. So this is like DAC tilde. In fact, it could be DAC tilde, except that I wanted to be able to use the output thing that I showed you earlier. And so instead of just putting the DAC right here, I put a throw. And it, and it all collects in this catch, and then it goes to this output object where I'm controlling the amplitude of the output. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's so that I, actually, it's so that I can control the volumes of them all in parallel. So, let's see, how can I get this thing on the screen? I can do this, maybe. Alt, alt, alt. Ha! There's a thing that's not easy to do on a Macintosh. Okay, so, so this is controlling globally the amplitude of the thing. By virtue of the fact that each one of these partials using the throw object has added itself at full strength to this catch, which then is going to be sent to the output, which will control its amplitude. So that's controlling all the amplitudes in parallel. Yeah? Right. So send and receive work for messages. There's a send tilde and receive tilde for signals. But in audio signal land, it's, the situation is a little bit more complicated because it would not be clear what to do if you had a bunch of sends and a bunch of receives. In message land, you just send all the, all the sends to all the receives. So here, yeah, it is exactly like a patch page. So here, what's happening is all of the throws are throwing to the single catch. There's a, there's a fan in thing, which is a summing bus, which is done by throwing catch. And there's also a fan out mechanism, which is which is accomplished by sin tilde and receive tilde, which I haven't shown you. Yeah. No, they're all hap No, it's it's like cables, so they're all happening in parallel. Right. So sequence. Yeah. So only messages can be sequenced. Signals can't really be sequenced. They're all happening all the time. Which is one of the good reasons to have messages around. Now, the partial, is showing off, uh, let's see. sorry, I have uh, window size trouble here. So the arguments to this partial were these numbers 1, 1, 0.5, 6, and 0. Those numbers are what showed up here. Where are they? All, 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 all. Oh. There. So these numbers one one zero point five six zero, which are uh, which are customizing this particular partial, uh, 
are displayed here and, and they are expanded by dollar one. Where did dollar one go? Here. No, sorry, that was that's wrong. I don't see dollar one yet. Here. In object boxes, if you put a dollar sign, it is the argument that you got called with as an abstraction. And here there is one of the half dozen truly hard to understand things about PD because dollar signs are also available inside message boxes except that they have a different function inside message boxes than they do inside objects. Uh, this is all for a good reason because conceptually it's all very simple even though, uh, even though it looks completely arbitrary and stupid. So what I want to do is show you, just to help confuse you now, I'm going to show you um, message boxes with dollar signs in it. So one, two, three, we all know what this will do. Let's see, I'll put a number in and I'll print it out. And then no matter what I put in, the printout says, hi, I was one, two, and three. Okay. Uh, you can't even see that it's getting repeated. Uh, I don't know. Okay, alt again. Alt, 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 alt. Okay, now suppose I want these numbers to vary as a function of this. I can say, for instance, dollar one. And dollar one means give me the value that was the number that came into this message box. I haven't shown you this because it was possible to do this already with pack. So the, so the easy way of getting this effect, I had to do it once before when I had to do it in order to make uh, to make those triples of numbers that went to the voices of the polyphonic sampler two days ago. Right? So this is another function of dollar signs. You can put a dollar sign inside a message and it will insert the number that you put in as part of the message. And the one here for dollar one is which of these numbers it is. If for instance, I gave it a packed message, let's see, this example. Now, dollar one is 45, like that, and dollar two is 78. Those of you who have uh, programmed shell scripts in either Macintosh land or Linux, this is exactly the same argument expansion that, that holds in, sh in shell scripts. Also, I think Perl might work this way, but I'm not sure about that. The computer scientists have a name for this kind of, of expansion, but I forget what it is. Yeah? Can you add another list? No, you could in Max, but here you have to actually use a pack object. Oops. So, for instance, here's another decent, uh, here's another perfectly good way to make a message that has a bunch of variables in it. And now, well, actually, at this point, I could now do this. And now I can set dollar two this way and set dollar one this way. Okay. This is okay. Since you already have seen pack, this is not. This is not something that you need. Uh, you will need it later, perhaps, because um, certain things like, oh, right, tables. If you want to tell a table what size it is, you say resize, and then you give it a number. If you want that number to be a variable, then you have to say resize $1 inside a message box. It's the only way to generate that kind of message. So this is a more general facility than pack. And as a result, it runs a little slower than pack too, so it's not necessarily the right way to do things in every case. Now, I told you that because I'm trying to confuse you so that you will later on be enlightened. The confusing thing is this. If you put dollar one inside a message box or dollar anything inside a message box, it means the incoming message that made me, that, that's making me now send a message, right? Because message boxes take messages in and send messages out. Object boxes, what you put in an object box is a message. It's a message whereby PD makes the object. And that, and that message can have dollar sign arguments in it too, but those dollar sign arguments are the arguments to the patch because the patch is running the message to make the object. 
Yeah. Can you send objects to me? Yeah. So you really want to. Like, for instance, um, oh, man. Yeah, so for instance, uh, apply plus five, <laughs> if you're a list person. Well, uh, let's make a nice thing called apply. You don't want to do this. <laughs> and apply is now going to say, hmm, dollar one, dollar two. Oh, come on, let me type in there. All right, and then I'll make an L and an outlet, just for fun. Petey hates me for doing this. It has no idea what dollar one means in, in an object box like this. But now, if I retype this, I now have a nice little plus five thing. Okay, go find a use for that. Oh, does it actually work? I don't think I've done this in a decade, so it works. Yeah. You could, yeah, don't do it. It's stupid. Oh yeah, dollar signs can either be numbers or they can be symbols. And I haven't told you symbols, which means strings, things that aren't numbers, like file names or names of objects like plus. Those are different kinds of, of data. And for the most part, I've only been using numbers except in the very rare occasions when I've had to specify a file name, like voice.wave. And I'm doing that on purpose. I'm trying to not get any deeper into into the soup of language com complexity than one absolutely has to to do computer music. Okay, so this is so this is message boxes, and that oh apply example was object boxes, but it was object boxes in such an abstruse example that I don't want to talk about anymore. <laughs> okay, so now oh well, we're saving there, which is bad. Ah, didn't want to put it there. Let's just not save this. This is, this is better explained somewhere else, probably. OK, so that was all to say this. Suppose someone gave you, OK, next it's time to say, what do these things mean? This thing, this thing, that thing, and that thing. Well, this is, this is a relative amplitude. This is a relative duration. This is a relative frequency, and this is a detune, which is to say a frequency offset, a frequency that's added to it. So we're talking about individual sinusoids, which are imitating individual modes of the sound of the bell. So each mode might have a different amplitude. That's actually not acoustically correct, because the amplitude would depend on how you struck the thing, but we're just pretending now. So each one is given a, its own amplitude, its own um, time constant, its own damping, uh, which in this example, just because Rise did it this way, is realized simply by changing the overall duration of the amount of time it rings. The correct thing to do acoustically would be to have it be a dying exponential and to have it go on forever. But that's not practical. So, so we just give it each partial a duration. So first argument is amplitude, second argument is duration, third argument is frequency. So, um, now, yeah, now I have to tell you something else. Each, uh, all of these things, well, not all these things, but the duration and the frequency are also controlled globally by the controls in the outer patch, which was here. Where? Here. So there's a pitch and a duration. Those are things which are going to have to be multiplied, well, once they're gotten to the right units, they'll have to be multiplied by the relative frequencies in order to figure out the real frequency to give the partial. So this partial, which has a frequency, a relative frequency of 0.56, what that really means is it's 0.56 times the global frequency that I asked the bell to be. So that when I change this frequency, the frequencies of all the partials change in parallel. All right, so how do we do that? So what that means is that we're going to have to take this thing which is being sent and multiply it by this number. 
and that will become the frequency that you send the oscillator. Except I didn't tell you another thing. Uh, you get a detune here, which is after you multiply the frequency by the after you multiply this factor by the global frequency, then add an offset so that um, so that uh, the partials can be paired in beating combinations. So th then this is all just history. You know, you can read this in books, like the book by Charles Dodge. Um, uh, each of these partials, well, here are two partials that have the same relative frequency, but one of them has an offset of nothing, and the other has an offset of one hertz. So after they compute their base frequencies, this one adds one hertz to itself so that it will beat with this one once per second, according to another principle that you saw in Music 170. Okay. So how do you do that? So what that means is that the oscillator that's inside here will get a frequency, in fact, which is 0.56 times this frequency plus this offset. So is that true? So here we are. Every time we get a trigger, we recompute the frequency. Oh, by the way, the, the thing is designed so that you hit the trigger and then you can start mousing away at the frequency and it doesn't change the frequency of the bell while it's ringing, which, you know, is one possible way you could design the instrument. It's the way the original instrument worked. So maybe it's a good way for us to do it. Okay, so this is dollar one, this is dollar two, this is dollar three, and this is dollar four. Those are the arguments that we got as a, as a sub object, as an abstraction. So dollar three is a hmm, yep. Dollar three will come out. Okay, this is we're just going to store dollar three, and then when this thing gives us a bang, we will read dollar three. And, oh, this is one voice that I'm figuring now, not the whole bell. And dollar three will come out here. It's 0.56, and it's going to get multiplied by a value which is received frequency that got sent from the main patch. And then we're going to add dollar four, which is zero, which is the detuning, and that is the frequency for the oscillator. And all of that stuff got done as messages. You can see the thin traces, and then the oscillator then is the first thing in this chain that makes an audio signal. Right. That's the easy part. That's that's well. It's the easy part. It does have two variables controlling it as opposed to one, but it's easy in the sense that now you just feed it as the frequency of the oscillator. The amplitude control, as you know, things have to get turned on and then turned off, and so the amplitude control has more pussy footing around setting the amplitude. So I'll show you that next. It's this. So the amplitude is being controlled by line tilde. Now the amplitude, there are two things that are being told us that are relevant to the amplitude. One is the first argument of the abstraction. Uh, this one here is the relative amplitude of this voice. And the other is the length of time, the relative duration of the voice, because to know how to do an envelope generator, you're going to have to know how high to make it, which is the amplitude that you're going to reach, and you have to know how long to make it. Okay. So here's the line tilde that's going to do it. And by the way, I raised the line tilde to the fourth power. I didn't say how, but if you take a signal and square it, then you get the signal to the second power. And then if you take that thing and square it, then you get the signal to the fourth power. And why fourth power not square? Just so the thing will really hug zero and go up like that, because that resembles more of the exponential curve that this thing would really be doing in real life. It's just, uh, it's just hand waving. It's this. There's no deep psychoacoustical truth to, to this that I know of. Okay. So what we have to do is we have to configure or confect two messages to line tilde. This is a little bit like what we had to do for the sampler, except in the opposite order. We have to turn it on and then we have to turn it off. In the sampler, actually, we had to do three things. We had to mute and then turn it on and then turn it off. So this is simpler than the sampler in terms of the sequence of operations that has to take place. Okay, so the attack portion over here is look up dollar one, which is our amplitude. The attack portion is just going to be go up to the amplitude and, and do it in five milliseconds, come what may. Why five milliseconds? It's a fast attack, but it's not quite a clicky attack. Yeah? 
the dollar, okay, so the dollar sign tells the float to substitute one of these arguments to the, to the abstraction. Yeah, so dollar one gets this one, dollar two gets that one, dollar three gets that one, and so on. It's a positional argument. That's the, the correct word for it. It's a positional argument. Positional parameter? I'm not sure. Okay. So this is so this this when it's uh, when it's expanded rather when when it's um, when it's built this is going to be float one and when it gets a bang out is going to come the number one. So this is just going to be one. We're going to multiply by point one to save our ears. Everything is going to get multiplied by point one in parallel, so it's good. And then because we're going to raise this to the fourth power, we should probably take the fourth root of this so that, so that then when it gets raised to the fourth power, it's the right number. So to take a fourth root, you take a square root twice. And then here, I didn't have to do this. I should have done this, I think, in the current context anyway. Pack 0, 5, which would then take this value and replace 0 with it, and then pack a 5, which would be the number of milliseconds the line would ramp to that value then. But instead, because I had just spent pages in the book describing this dollar one madness. Um, at this point, it seemed appropriate to put dollar signs in messages. And so this is make a, make a message whose value is this number and then five. And here is, again, the distinction between objects and messages and dollar signs. Dollar sign inside a message means, uh, sorry, inside an object means in the context of when the patch is created, we have to build this thing. And so the dollar sign is evaluated when the patch is created. And, and, it's, and it's created with these arguments. Dollar sign here is in the context of the message that it is sent, which is the thing which causes it to send the message itself. So this is in the runtime context, if you like, and this is in the build time context or something like that. Yeah. You don't. Uh, the the only reason that triggers there really is to make this thing a little prettier. Uh, oh, it's psychological. It's to group these two things. <laughs> but in fact, it has no function because, as you're quite right, this delay would ensure that this thing happened after this thing anyway. Okay. So this now, if 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 th only this existed, and not that, then you would get this. The attack shape of the envelope and no decay shape. And now I'm going to do this to make it shut up. As it is, you do that and then you decay. And decaying is actually easier than attacking. It is, all right, we wait five milliseconds because the attack took five milliseconds. So we wait for the line tilde to get up to its apex. And then we start the decay portion of the envelope, which is Look up the duration. Okay, so the attack is five milliseconds regardless of the duration. The decay, now, we know what the target is. It's going to go down to zero, so it'll shut up. But what we don't know yet is how long it's going to take in order to get there. That we have to now compute. So we're going to make a message again. But whereas the message in this case had, um, had a constant time but a variable amount that it went up, in this case, it has a constant that it goes down to, which is zero, but a variable amount of time to do it. And how do you compute that? Well, after five milliseconds, when it's time to start doing this, pick up the value $2, which is this value. It's one here, but it will be different numbers for the different partials. Multiply it by the global duration. That was sent to us there. Uh, yeah, it's 800. So this duration is 800, but this is now 1, so this is going to be 1 times 800, which is 800 again. And so this will be the message 0, 800. So that means that this thing should last 8 tenths of a second. Hard to tell because it dies out in, inaudibly. And now if I get another one out, this one, this one will be higher and lower. There's a, 
Here's a medium long one, or a longish one. Here's a shortish one with a higher pitch and a shorter decay. That's because here the arguments are, oh, we're louder. <laughs> we're a relative loudness of 1.46 instead of, oh, I'm sorry, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, relative loudness of 1.46. Uh, relative duration only a quarter as long. So this thing lasts one quarter as long as the other one did. And then the frequency is two as opposed to this frequency, which was 0.56. So it's almost two octaves up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. This one... Okay, so what goes in here is dollar two. I've, let's see, dollar two here is 0.25, so it's going to multiply 0.25 by 800, which is duration. So it'll get 200 here, and so this will become the message zero 200. The other one here, I don't know what this amplitude is, but it would be the amplitude that number five. So this is zero 200 and blah five something five. So if you hear all these things together, you get beautiful computer music. And there's some psychoacoustics there too. Okay, you can pick this up. This was in this was in the help uh, browser, blah, 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 d7additive.pd. This is the first example in, in the PD examples, I think, of, of something that does multiple voices. And there are two others that are of note here that I want to show you that I'll get to next time. Oh, homework. The homework is just what you've heard done. Oh, do I have the patch that does it? I don't remember. its own antithesis. <laughs> so you all know how to do this because this is nothing but a loop and sampler. It's just you're just going to have to figure out how to get it to be the appropriate original pitch but last a lot longer than it would have lasted and envelope it so that it doesn't sound buzzy. So it's a straightforward application of what I've been showing you the last couple of days.